Well, you guys timed it about right. The folks coming in at the 8 o'clock service got drenched on their way in, so you guys waited for the dry one. I hope that's just referring to the weather and not the message. We'll see how it goes. Um, we're in a series called Sacred Rhythms. What are the, the routines, the habits, the patterns we can establish in our lives that actually help us to become stronger, more fruitful, uh, more understanding? And uh, these are interesting uh, things to think about because often we think in terms of our, our habits and routines as something we, we try really hard to do. We've been talking about things that it's more about training taking steps that will eventually allow us to be able to do something we're not able to do right now by trying. And so this morning we are going to take a look at a passage uh, from Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke and chapter 18, and this is what it says. Jesus is having a teaching moment and he says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. All right, so now we know what the context is. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. As it turns out, tax collectors have had a bad reputation in every generation, in every culture in human history. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance, and he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. There's another passage I'd like to, us to reference in terms of setting our thoughts for our discussion today, and it comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, where Jesus called his disciples together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your, what's the next word? Servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. One of the truths about sins in our lives is that they tend to camouflage themselves. And I don't just mean that we cover them up. I mean, often they blend in a way that it's a little bit hard to recognize what's going on. It takes a little while for us to realize how our actions and our attitudes have brought destruction to ourselves or to others in our lives. There's some challenges also that in our culture, there's a real um, resistance to identifying anything as being out of bounds. Uh, there's a lot of language about we just have to make up our own rules and do what's right for us. And our world tends to think that there's no such thing as limitation, that, that the real definition of freedom is to not have any limitations. Everything's on the table. Everything is an option for you. And then, on top of that, there's this concept of shame. Every single one of us have had multiple experiences in our life where somebody said something to us, and they weren't just trying to help us. They were trying to hurt us. And they brought up something that was a failure or a misstep in our life in a way that made us not just think we did a bad thing, but that we were a bad person. And so whenever God comes into our lives to to correct or redirect a thing, often we mishear his tone. He has not come to make us lesser. He's come to make us better. But we hear him through the voices of other people who have brought pain into our lives. What I want to talk about today is one particular sin, and it's the sin of pride. And it's a very ancient sin. In fact, theologians believe it is the first sin. So what does pride look like? And pride is a preoccupation with my appearance. This is the lowest level of pride. 
Uh, we want to make sure that, that, that we look reasonably good. I've noticed that on the pictures we all put on social media, we look pretty good. They even have apps. If you don't look good enough, you can whiten your teeth, take out blemishes, even put yourself in a far more attractive location. It's just amazing what you can do. And there's nothing wrong with putting our foot, best foot forward, but it can turn into something else. By the way, have you ever, has this ever happened to you? It's happened to me, where someone posted a picture of them, but I was in the background. And I actually spent more time looking at me in their picture than them. So that's kind of entry-level pride. And then there is a rejection of correction. This is another level of pride. When somebody calls us on something where we stepped out of bounds, um, we, we defend ourselves strongly. There's a lot of responses we can have when somebody calls us out on something. We can try to avoid the conversation altogether, just evade certain people or certain environments or certain conversations that would kind of require us to deal with it. We can also deny that we've actually done anything inappropriate, and we can justify our actions. It's not really out of bounds if you understood what was going on, or we can always blame somebody else. These, these are very common strategies that have their root in pride. We might actually know we stepped out of bounds and we're wrong, but we have trouble admitting it. Why is that? And at the root of that is pride. And then there's a distortion of our ability to love. Pride will do more to cause you to eliminate people and remove people from your life than almost anything else. It's just a, a very true thing. The, the love of self can become so demanding that the love of others becomes difficult. And this creates a number of challenges for us. The same pride that hides our own sins from us hides other things too. It hides how judgmental we can become. There are, there are things that we don't notice about others which makes our judgment of them easier. In order to judge someone, you really have to believe that you are better than that. The most convicting pride statement that pops up in my mind is the one where the thought comes, and sometimes I say it, I would never do that. And I didn't just announce how bad I thought someone else's actions were, I just announced how good I thought I was in comparison. Uh, pride can make us very suspicious of people who are doing better than us. If they're doing better, they must have cheated. And if they're doing worse, they're not as strong. Pride distorts our capacity to see others clearly and love them appropriately. So what's the antidote to Pride, and the antidote to pride is humility. But that's challenging for us because in our language and in our culture, humility sounds a lot like humiliate. And so we assume that this is all about someone putting our, us down or us putting ourselves down. Humility is actually just the ability to think about something other than yourself. Just think about that, something other than yourself. It's the ability to focus on where you are more than where you wish you were. You know, just wish I wasn't here. Um, it's, re it's really hard, it's really hard to stop being a tax collector without becoming a Pharisee. And this is the temptation for us, right? As soon as we start making progress, we notice the progress that we've made. Um, we also notice those who aren't making as much progress. And we can have some ungracious assumptions about them. So don't give any knowing glances or raise your hand or nod your head. Just, just act like you're ignoring me. <laughs> but anybody here ever been on a diet? Don't you hate those things? I just... And, and so we'll go on a diet. But if you're on a diet and it's working for you, do you ever find yourself saying something like this? 
I just feel so much better. I would never go back to eating like that again. Oh, yes, you will. <laughs> and then you'll go in a restaurant where you are now eating your healthy diet. And you look at those people who are just filling their faces with all that crud. It's unbelievable. How do they do that? Well, you know how they do it. And you too will do it again. But there's just something about us. If, if we establish a pattern of, of a quiet time with God, how often we want to share with someone that that's become a consistent thing. If, if we're getting in shape, we have to... We have to communicate. We have to find a way just to let everybody know I'm making progress in this. It's really, really hard to make progress without calling a lot of attention to it. So how do we do this? Because faith journey is about making progress. So how do we do that without becoming a Pharisee? And the answer is, is that the way to develop humility is not about putting yourself down. The way to develop humility is to do something for someone else. This is a really big concept. If you want to accelerate humility, serve someone. If you want to hyper-accelerate humility, serve someone secretly. No one will know who did it. By the way, there's something inside of us that will resist serving and it becomes an all-out war if we're going to serve anonymously. But Jesus actually models this for us. Jesus, a lot of times, in fact, there's this great passage in Philippians 2 where it says, Jesus, though he was equal with God, did not consider that something to be held on to, but became a servant, became human, and was obedient to the point of death. It's a great passage in Philippians chapter 2. And what it's telling us is something rather remarkable, that Jesus wasn't setting aside divinity in order to serve. Jesus did not come incognito. Jesus came incarnate. He's not hiding who God is. He's revealing who God is. We have a creator who actually serves. God is the most powerful, most knowledgeable being in all the universe, and he spends no time thinking about himself or comparing himself to anybody else. That's really amazing. In fact, I think one of the reasons Christ calls us to be part of a community is because it, it, it kind of brings humility along with it. I mean, we all behave pretty well around here for about an hour on Sunday. But let's turn this into a four-hour service and see how we manage that. Let's just all go to each other's houses after church today and, and see how we manage that. It's, it's hard to hide the truth about yourself from people when you see them more often. And so community kind of pulls us into that. Uh, when we serve others, it actually builds our connection with them and draws our heart towards them. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that's not true, Pastor. It's when they serve me that I feel better about them. But th that's our assumption, but we're wrong about that. And I can prove it if you're a parent. If you are a parent, are you going to tell me you love your kids so much because of all they've done for you? <laughs> it's you? It's not. They're never going to make that balance right. Not in their whole life. You will die before that happens. They've, you've given and given and given and helped and, and, and been there and supported and strengthened and listened. And you, and you do it day after day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and you love them like crazy. It's not what people do for us that attracts our heart to them. It's what we do for others. This is a really important concept in understanding how humility can work in our lives. And when we serve others, we often think in terms of the gain is that they benefit. Can I suggest to you that the gain that occurs, the greater gain, is not just that someone else has helped. It's that we embrace humility, which causes other things to grow in our life. Serving others does more to transform you than the person you're helping. It's a really important thing. 
So we're talking about these habits, remember, and we're talking about them in terms of training, not just trying. So, um, so how can we kind of train uh, in, in to build some uh, muscles and humility? And, and one thing is you could serve someone who doesn't make you feel important. Serve someone who doesn't make you feel important. A lot of times when we serve someone who has virtually no status, we can feel like we wasted our time, our effort, or our energy. And it's really easy to want to help someone who might be able to help us back. But if you want a really eye-opening experience, just read through the Gospels and see how much time Jesus spent serving people who added nothing to his status. Not one thing. And we don't have to leave our house to have these kinds of options available to, it, to us. Uh, when, when you serve others, you grow in that sense of community, and, you, and your tightest community and the easiest one to access is right at home. It can be something little. It can be something simple. But those things can make a big difference. And here's the thing to understand about this, is that God might speak to us through the people who seem the weakest to us. Some of us will only ever listen and pay attention to the voice of God if it comes from someone that we hold in high regard and have demonstrated some capacity for success in life. And what you need to know is if that's the only people you will listen to, you have muted most of the channels God will use to communicate something to you. What if God could speak to you through your children, through your spouse, through a neighbor? What if God has something to say through them? That could be a very powerful thing. So serve someone who won't make you feel important, and then serve someone at an inconvenient time. Because I probably could open all of our phone apps today and look at the calendar, and we probably don't have serving as an item that we've listed in there. We all have agendas, we all have schedules, we all have responsibilities, and we derive a kind of sense of importance from what we carry and what we do. But sometimes a diaper needs changed, or a tear needs dried, or a prayer needs to be prayed. And it's not on our schedule. And it would be really easy to think that's someone else's job. And that's okay. Sometimes it is. But there's a difference between thinking, I think that's someone else's assignment, and the thought, I don't do that. We need to think through what's the subterranean thought that drives some of our actions. So, um, serving isn't, uh, but by the way, if you, if you do something at an inconvenient time, I, I can tell you it is true that there are always going to be people who would want to take advantage of that. They will, they will drive your entire calendar of your day. They, they will take everything you have and, and you will accomplish nothing else. That's not what this conversation is about. We need to be really careful that we don't make unhealthy people our excuse for refusing to serve someone who isn't as important or it's not as convenient. And then humility just acknowledges limitations. It acknowledges limitations. We can't be everywhere. We can't do everything. A lot of the things that we complain about doing are actually choices we have made. So we need to make choices that honor our need for things like community and rest and recreation. So, for example, what would it look like if you seriously took a day off? Our culture doesn't give a lot of credit for that. If you took a real day off and filled it with the kind of things that that bring joy to your life? What if you took your need for community seriously? Because some of us have actually come to the place now where we think, I don't need people in my life. Well, that's not true. So if you were going to acknowledge your need for community, how would you go about that? 
How about your need for rest each day? The Western culture is sleep deprived. And, uh, and, and we, we brag about it. Oh, I only got four hours of sleep last night. This is going to be a long day. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. Thank God for coffee. I was walking through a, a bookstore the other day, and I can't, there was a book that just kind of stood out by reason of its design and its title. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I picked it up, and I opened it up, and I came to a spot on the page. It was the first thing I saw. And a person was asking the author, where do you find the discipline to get out of bed when the alarm clock goes off for the first time in the morning? Now, I've got my own strategy. For years, my strategy was to put my alarm clock in the closet. It's true. I did that for years. And then when the alarm clock would go off, in order to shut it off, I had to get up and get in the closet. And then once I shut it off, I was sufficiently annoyed that I might as well just keep going. So. But the, the person wanted to know, so where do you find the discipline to just get up when the alarm clock goes off the first time? And the author's response was, that's not where you need the discipline. The discipline is going to bed earlier the night before. And so I said, I don't like this book. And I put it down and <laughs> I did not buy it. <laughs> Humility also means saying less. Not every thought is necessary to express. I remember teaching that to our children. We don't need to say everything we think, and we don't need to take credit for everything we do, and we don't need to tell a story every time that makes us appear a little bit better. Humility may choose to say something that even acknowledges a struggle or a missed opportunity or a challenge. These are some things that we can just incorporate into a regular rhythm in our lives. And the reason I think it's worthwhile is because we can see what has happened in our life as a result of what someone else did for us. You see, Jesus didn't serve just to make a point. He served to make a difference. And he didn't tap out when the lash of the whip was cutting into his flesh. He didn't resign when the voices were opposed to him, when the nails were driven into him, when the wounds were deep, and when there was torture that was being imposed on him. If servanthood was a disguise, he could have cast it aside right at that moment and revealed who he really was, but it was no disguise. When you strip God down to the bare element, he is a servant, and he came to make a difference, not by demanding his way, but by paying the way for the rest of us. And the thing is, once you've tasted that, it changes you. And once you've experienced that kind of change in your life, you want others to experience it too. That's Bower Heads this morning. So how can this become a rhythm, a routine, a, a habit in our lives? And it might be something as simple as just, so when you finally work your way out of bed, whether it's the first time the alarm goes off or the fifth time, that you find a way to remind yourself, maybe it's something you write down or something you see. But maybe you just ask God, would you give me the opportunity to serve someone who, well, maybe they're not someone I see as important, or maybe it's not convenient. Would you give me the opportunity to do something without calling attention to it? And a prayer as simple as that can open little windows to our day we wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And those are the windows that grace flows through. 
Those are the windows where growth occurs. Those are the windows when something inside of us that we desperately need and don't know it gets ministered to. And now we have something to release to others. Heavenly Father, um, would you help us find a way to regularly include in our day an opportunity to serve, to serve others, to serve others anonymously, to serve others that can't pay back, to serve others just because you place them in our path. Not because it's easy, not because it's convenient, but because you're asking us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you stand with me this morning?